Okay, so the first structure we're going to show you is the mental existence structure, which is the hypo part of existence structure. And what happens in the mental existence structure is that because the womb is not very welcoming, the baby has to find a way to get away from the, the physical connection of an unfriendly, unwelcoming environment. And the way they do that, and, you, and I'll start to do it as I'm talking about it, is I pull my energy from my skin into the center of my body, from the center of my body into my spine, and from my spine up into my head. And as I do that, um, I might also have some twists in my spine as I'm trying to get away from that unfriendly contact. And then I really go out into the universe, because that's a lot friendlier. And I get that really far away look. My body is not a friendly place to be in for me, and contact with the environment is really not fun. Right now I just try to pull out of my body, so I'm sort of above and out. Now I'll just come back into my body. So now we'll look at the emotional existence structure, which is the hyper part of the existence structure. And what happens to this person is that when they're in the womb, there is this very welcoming experience. And then something happens and it breaks. It could be because the mom has some trauma, or it could be because the mom gets sick, or it could be because the environment doesn't support her being happy about being pregnant in some way. And so she pulls energy away from this connection to her baby, and the baby feels it. So they go from feeling welcome to what happened? Where did everybody? What? Where to go? The energy is not in the head; it's into the body, and there's all the energy goes into the skin and to the periphery of the body, and there's this wanting and searching for that connection that's gone. And there's a lot of energy for that. And they're looking all, they're looking any place they can to have that. And there's a kind of desperateness in looking for contact because they know what it feels like and it's been lost. Right now, because there's no one else in the room, I'm feeling it a lot. Um, I don't know where to go for the contact, and my energy is pushing me out, and there's no place to go. And it's a little scary uh, to be this alone. My world has disappeared.
and that's a review. So need structure starts after birth and goes to about a year and a half. And that's when the child, hopefully, with a healthy resolution, is getting support from their primary caretakers to learn how to ha help their needs for love, for comfort, for contact, for food, for sleep, all those, for stimulation, all those parts of them are learned to be regulated in relationship with the people that they're closest to. Um, and they learn to have these cycles of contact, relaxation, of food, satiation, of sleep, uh, to wait. These are all cycles of contact that are regulated in relationship. If that does not happen, there are two outcomes. And the first one is the early need or the hypo or the despairing need structure. And what can happen to that person as a baby is they sort of give up and they go into a very despairing part. And it can look something like this in the adult. There's the searching in the eye. also longing for that contact because remember this is how the child really explores the world is through their mouth and in an adult is this loose lips and longing in the eyes in the chest there's a collapse two ways there's both this way, and this way. The shoulders are forward, and the spine is collapsed, too. And I'll turn to the side and show you what that can look like. So for the late need structure, the hyper structure, there's a similar mismatch in helping to regulate, but there has been some connection that works and then it doesn't. Um, so the child develops into a, an adult who is rather mistrustful of that that's ever gonna happen. And because there's more energy in the muscles, the collapse is not quite as strong. So in the body, Remember, we had this for the early. If you put a little more energy in the muscles, so I still have it, but there's more energy and it's not as deep. And for the face, there's the lips are not loose. They're First, like, yeah, sure, you're going to give it to me. And the eyes have that mistrustful look. And as a matter of fact, one can be mistrustful and the other can be pulled back. So let's see if I can do that. this deep dis mistrust and the body holds that and it leads to this feeling of even if you give it to me even if I say what it is and you give it to me it doesn't 
doesn't mean anything. It's not right. Because I had to ask. And I'm not going to get it anyway. So it's never quite right. And that's sort of where they get stuck in that mistrust and it's never fully broke. So I'll show you the, the body a little bit more from the side. There's a lot more energy in this than there was in the early structure. What we're going to do now is look at how autonomy structure looks in the body when there's some kind of disruption. So the theme for autonomy structure, it's that developmental stage, is you have enormous curiosity and impulse to go into the world. Um, so there's all this energy and all this delight and all this exploration that just you, you cannot stop yourself. And if you can't stop yourself and you're supported in that, that's, it's, it's just this unblossoming of um, all these skills that start to come online. However, if there are disruptions, and the early disruption would be a hypo, where the message is your energy is too much, or I can't handle it, or every time you try and do something, somebody is interfering with it and saying stop or taking it over or whatever, you learn not, not to allow that part of you to emerge. And what happens is your energy sinks down into the lower part of your body. There's a, there's a triangle of energy. There's a, narrowing at the top because all this collapses and there's this widening at the bottom and there is a expression of pleasantly waiting for someone to engage you because then it's okay to respond and, and feel some impact. position. And for the healthy autonomy, the resource autonomy, the triangle of energy and movement and activity is much more of a rectangle of there's an equal distribution from the top to the bottom of the trunk. And there's some curiosity in the eyes and there's looking around and they're looking for what catches their eye so they can start to move towards that or engage with that. So now we're going to talk about the late autonomy structure. That's when there's a disruption later in the developmental stage or more severe um, there's some impulses that have started and then shut down. And what happens to that little kid is that they pull their energy out of their center and have all this energy that's sort of up at the top of their body, but they don't have a center. And they're looking around a lot for whatever catches their energy and their attention and their, their impulse, but it's it's fast, it's rather uh, uncentered, and contact is not what they're looking for because that is a little too vulnerable. It's things, movement, energy, whatever there is to in they can engage with that doesn't involve uh, any chance of being manipulated because they have felt manipulated, or any chance of 
being suppressed because uh, someone, someone's, they don't want someone to come and stop them. So they're constantly on the move, they've got a lot of energy, and that's what that looks like in the body. It's this broad triangle on top and not a lot down here. And then I'll come down. So more resource to get. Where I have a triangle, I mean a, a rectangle of energy from the top to the bottom. Both parts of my body are connected to. So now we're going to talk about will structure. And will structure is a time when children are coming out with intention and power. And they can start to make plans. They really start to separate and differentiate. It's when they start knocking against the parents and saying, you know, no, I don't want to do that. Or you're stupid. I'm going to get another mother. Or, you know, all of that kind of behavior because they've differentiated. They know they're different. They want to be different. And they, they have a much clearer boundary. Um, however, if there's an interruption early or severely in that developmental stage, they go into what we call the self-sacrificing will structure. And what that looks like in the body, okay, so, they don't have much center, they, they collapse around their diaphragm and their latissimus in the back. The shoulders come forward, the head comes forward, and there's this sort of apologetic look in the face and the eyes because they believe if there's a problem, it's their fault. And they'll do whatever they can do to take on this burden and to help you out and hope that if they take care of you, that maybe then they'll get some contact of what they need. And so I'll turn to the side and show you what that can look like. There's a sort of a hang dog quality. And I feel myself sighing a lot when I do that. Like, okay, it's okay, I can I can take it. And I'm sorry if I I'm sorry if what I'm giving you isn't. So I'll come out of that to more resource position where I have energy, I have intention, I can give to you, but I also can sense my limits and take care of myself. I don't go way past them and I don't get stuck there. So now we're going to talk about what happens in late will structure. Late will structure happens when the child has energy, has intention, is able to follow, come out with their power, and then something hits and they have to hold it back. So there's energy in these muscles, but there's compression and really holding back. So my center is like tense, my diaphragm is tense, my Tissimus is tense, my levator is tense, my posterior deltoid are tense, my hands are tense, and I have this uh, expression of, I'm, I'm just, if something's wrong, it's you, because I've tried my hardest, and if you don't, if you don't like it, then something's wrong with you, and I'm tired of feeling all this pressure and I'm really I can't actually I can't stand how my body feels right now but um, there's I think you can probably sense that there's a lot of energy that I'm containing and it's not very pleasant to feel for me and it's probably not that pleasant for you to think about hanging out with me so it looks more like this There's that you're ready to be defensive look and sense of energy. And I'm actually getting a little tired of holding this, so I'm going to come out of that. Ooh, back into just hanging out with me. Okay, 
So now we're going to go to love sexuality. And that's a developmental stage where the, the body starts to change in the child. They start to lengthen. They start to have more movement. Uh, and um, when they move, they start to be able to push off on their feet. And there's some movement. I'll show you a little bit in the hip. Um, start to be able to walk a little because they're pushing off so their hips start to come out side to side. Um, and so in the, early, in the early disruption, the child gets a lot of contact. We call it the romantic position. The child gets a lot of contact for their loving feelings. And what it can develop in as an adult is that they have a very romantic, sort of idealized idea about what the world is like and what relationships especially are like. And they come out, their pelvis is retracted and their hearts are sort of coming forward and open. And they have this way of being sort of coy and a little flirty and don't really realize how that comes across that, well, hi, you know, it's so, God, it's, I'm so, Sweet to meet you. That kind of coyness. And they don't understand that that can be very attractive to other people. And they have this idea about love that, oh, you know, someday I bet I'm going to meet someone who's really special and everything's going to be great and love, love will just take care of it all. So there's this romantic notion of what relationships are about. So now we're going to talk about late love sexuality, where the problem has been that the child has been appreciated for their sensuality or for their beauty, but not for their romantic or loving heartfelt feelings. So what that can look like in an adult, both behavior-wise and in the body, is that, remember in the early structure, the, the genitals are pulled back, there's a retraction in the pelvis. This time it's like they lead and present their genitals. Their heart's more closed because they felt that part of them is not appreciated. And they're really, really looking for contact because they want that sexual contact. That's what makes them feel alive. So they really have a very direct approach. They're very interested in making you feel that you're the only one in the room. And you know what? That's because you are so delicious looking that I'm really wanting you. And I'm going to turn around and walk back the way they might. feel like I'm a panther, just sort of stalking that prey. So that's late love sexuality body. Okay, so now we're going to talk about opinion structure, which is the age, developmental age between five and eight years old. And it's when children start to put together their mind with their center. And they start to be able to think about things and handle complexity in a different way. Um, with, ab with some abstract reasoning, in, in that they're thinking about norms, values, and opinions about how things are. And they're asking a lot of questions about why are things this way? Why does our family do it this way? Why does somebody else's family do it that way? And so there are very, there's a lot of mental curiosity and exploration about trying to make sense of why the world is the way it is. So if that's not supported, and if for some reason the child is made to feel that that curiosity, those questions that they're asking uh, is not allowed or is not supported in their family or 
you're asking too many questions, or what do you know, how can you, dis how can you know that you're just a child? They'll start to go into a more early opinion structure. And what that can look like in the body is their lower, uh, their, their gluteus, where they might be centered with some resource on the superior part of the, of the gluteus max. It's not so much tone. Their lower latissimus, which is the lower fibers of the latissimus in the back, also loses a little tone. Their rotators in their spine are a little loose, so they start to sort of go side to side in their movement. You see these kids sort of hanging out, gangly, chewing their gum. Um, and the opponent's muscles in their hands, are, are, which is being able to push your pinky and your thumb together, are not very resourced, so there's a collapse there. And although there's more energy in this hypo structure than there are in the earlier developmental times of hypo, there's still a kind of attitude about, I'm not going to tell you what I think, but you get it more with the attitude. And the attitude can look sort of like this. If someone at, you know, asks you, what do you, th what do you think about this? They'll go, Or if they actually have some opinion, but they're not going to come out with it, and you've done something that, that they have an opinion about, but they're not going to come into the fight about it, they'll be more, even more attitude like, sure, sure, Dad, sure, whatever you say. And if they hold that position of, just not really coming out with their opinion or actually not having an opinion, which is even a little less resourced of, oh, I don't know. That's more typical of the person who is in the early opinion structure of what we call sullen. So for the late opinion structure, this child has gotten support and contact for being able to get into that kind of opinion fight. And they feel value, they feel valued for being able to do that. So in the body, what that can look like is there's a tension in the upper gluteus, there's a tension in the lower latissimus, there's a real, can be real tension in the rotators of the spine, so much so that they really, I mean, if they want to see what's behind them, they actually have to turn to see what's behind them because there's so much rigidity in the spine. And the next thing that can happen is that their opponent's muscles can be really, really tight. They're, you can see this in their hands. There's this, and sometimes there can be the thumb or the, or the pinky just really coming towards each other, which isn't a, a normal la relaxed position. And there's this coming forward in their eyes, they're pushing themselves forward, and they're going to come out with their opinion about how it is, and as an adult, these people get into fight opinions, fights with people, and enjoy it, and even if it means these fights cause them to lose relationship, they have to express their opinion. They have to come out with it. And there's the energy that they don't know how to let go of. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the developmental stage that's called solidarity performance. And that's about the age from 7 to 12, when children start to experience themselves in their peer group, and they're trying to figure out what roles they're most comfortable in their peer group. And there's different roles children can take. One is to be the leader, to really come forward with their skills, their resources, in support of the group, and to be able to be proud of that part of themselves, to test that part of themselves, 
And another role is to be a group member where they can allow other people to come forward with their resources and with that they have and be happy that that person can perform in that way and be in that role. When a child gets stuck, they, can, they usually get stuck in one of two positions. And one of them is what we call more leveling, the leveling position. And in that, in that leveling position, the child is stuck in the role of really feeling anxious or not knowing how to step into a leadership position. And what that can look like in the body is there's a collapse in the lower um, gluteus maximus. There's a collapse in the lower latissimus dorsi. So there's a coming forward in the chest. There's also a lack of tone or tonicity uh, collapse in the um, erector spinae from about vertebrae 9 to 12 that causes the body to come forward a little like this from, the, from that, uh, the chest comes forward a little, there's a little rounding in the shoulders. And the look in the eyes is a soft look of sort of looking around the group to see how everybody's doing. And the, the body can be overly flexible, so at times it can be resourced, but it can move into an overly flexible position. And their tendency is to want the whole group to sort of work together where no one stands out. And that's where they're comfortable too. They don't want to stand out so much themselves. So there's this kind of looseness around leadership, uh, anxiety around leadership. So the second position in solidarity of performance is the more hyper or rigid position. And that's someone who has been supported for only when they're the leader or when they win or when they perform better than anybody else. And what happens to a child in that position is they can be stuck in that role of only valuing themselves or only feeling they will be valued when they're the best, when they win, when they're the star. And so what that can look like in the body is there's a lot of tension pushing themselves forward from the lower gluteal muscles, from the lower latissimus, and from that the, the 9 through 11 lateral fibers of the erectors where they're really, they really push themselves forward into situations and the, the, the way they look around is look is sort of scanning the room to see who's their competitor, what they can do to stand out. It's really hard for them not to speak up when someone asks a question if they know the answer. That, that they really need to be out there and be the best and to be the star. And it's tiring, but they don't sense that. What they sense is they lose value if they're not there. 